Welcome back to Black News Tonight. Millions of people who had been receiving unemployment benefits since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic could be seeing their last payday as special programs established under the CARES Act ended this week. Meanwhile, those still collecting regular state unemployment will no longer get the $300 per week supplement that had been offered by the federal government. This is the biggest ever cut to unemployment benefits in the history of the United States, with nearly 11 million American workers taking an economic hit and hospitalizations from COVID-19 still rising. How does this affect the most vulnerable members of our society, especially low-income families and communities of color? Joining me now to answer that question and to discuss this issue of vital importance are Saru Jayaraman, the president of One Fair Wage, and Andrew Stetner, senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Thank you both for joining me on Black News tonight. Andrew, I want to start with you. Give us a sense of the scale of what's just happened. What does it mean for black and brown workers who historically have had higher rates of unemployment anyway? Well, I mean, I think we've never seen this many workers cut off of benefits uh, at once. As your opening said, you know, 8 million plus to lose all uh, their benefits, another uh, 2 million that will lose that $300 uh, supplement. And, you know, this has been a very unique uh, economic downturn. Um, yes, black unemployment has always been high uh, during recessions, but it's been even more concentrated during this pandemic. You know, it's been those service sector jobs, you know, restaurants, hotels, uh, and not our factories or our construction workers you know, that uh, that lost um, work because of COVID. And, you know, when things picked up, uh, many of the white workers, you know, that temporarily were furloughed, the national shutdown, they were able to go back to work, but we saw black unemployment uh, not go back down. Uh, and these are the workers that have relied the most uh, on unemployment benefits. And it's coming at a time um, when we were told, you know, that we'd have herd immunity and things would be back to normal you know, by Labor Day 2021, and we're not there. Uh, and now these benefits have been cut off. Uh, and we know from the data and you know, our own experiences that some of the stimulus funds and other funds that were given, you know, it, you know, you know, black and Latino families, they had to spend that to catch up on their bills. Um, and then unlike white families who may be able to save a little bit more of that money. So now they're gonna have a personal safety net. The, the jobless safety net is not there, uh, and finding work just got really complicated because of this Delta surge. Well, so, Saru, you work directly with low-income workers of color, especially in the food industry. Uh, help me paint a picture here, a human picture of this. Uh, what are some of the things you're seeing? Well, the truth is that uh, <clears throat> a lot of the folks we represent were never able to get unemployment insurance to begin with. Um, you know, there is a sub-minimum wage in our industry. Tipped workers can receive a wage as little as $2.13 an hour because they're supposed to get tips. It's a direct legacy of slavery. It results in tremendous inequity, poverty, sexual harassment, racial inequity because of customer bias and tipping. Um, and so a lot of workers, when the pandemic shut, shutdown happened last year, about two thirds of the workers we surveyed, and we surveyed about 250,000 workers, two thirds told us they couldn't get unemployment insurance because they were told their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. So a lot of the workers that may be cut right now, we've seen already workers of color, low wage workers already experience what a lot more workers are gonna be experiencing right now. In the service sector, a lot of workers who couldn't get unemployment insurance last year went back to work before they felt safe, before they felt ready. They found tips were way down, sexual harassment was way up, hostility was way up, and health risks, of course, were way up. And it resulted in millions of workers leaving the industry last year and saying, I'm done, you don't pay me enough to put up with this level of risk and hostility and harassment and um, left the industry. And they're saying now, we don't wanna go back unless you pay us a full livable wage with tips on top. So not only is cutting unemployment insurance right now cruel, cruel in the middle of a pandemic, it's also just completely stupid. It's really dumb 
policy. Because if you believe that somehow uh, cutting these benefits is going to have a lot of workers suddenly run and, and be willing to take $2 jobs, it's just not the case. We actually just did two studies. First, we studied workers across the country, 2,000 workers, um, workers who remain in the industry. Millions have left. But workers who remain in the industry, 53%, more than half of workers say they're leaving. 78% say they'll only stay or come back if they got a full livable wage with tips on top. Then we looked at five states that prematurely cut their unemployment insurance benefits to see, okay, is it going to force a lot of restaurant workers to go back? 57% of workers in those five states said, we're not going to stay in this industry. And 80% say we will not stay unless we get a full livable wage with tips on top. So it's really not just cruel, but just dumb and, and honestly, totally ineffective policy to cut off people's unemployment yeah. insurance, but thinking it's going to force people to go back to work. People are done. People, what we're hearing is that people are done. They're not going to put up with this level of risk for such level, such low pay. <clears throat> Andrew, Saru is raising a powerful point here. She's saying people are working, are being asked to work harder for less money under worse conditions and throughout the pandemic even risk their, their health and maybe their very lives. And the idea of this is that it will somehow stimulate the economy and the stimulation of the economy is predicated on cutting the benefits. Help me understand why this logic prevails. Why, wh whose idea is this, right? Why is this happening in the first place? Why would benefits come to an end when the pandemic isn't over? I, I, I can't wrap my mind around the logic of this. Well, yeah, I want to get in. One thing I do want to say, you know, I want to say thanks again for being on the show. And also it's great to be with Saru, you know, on this day, September 10th. Um, people may know Saru is a hero in September 11th, organizing worker, those workers who lost their jobs in the windows in the world and other restaurants, and has kept that work going on for 20 years. So I just want to say it's a real honor uh, to be with her uh, tonight on this show. And I'm sad I can't be in New York with you uh, as you mark that uh, anniversary. You know, the, this was an agenda pushed by the Chamber of Commerce, um, you know, starting in the spring uh, of this year. Um, you know, in an effort to take away workers' power, to take away their right to uh, go back to a suitable job, a job that was safe, that was a decent pay, and was well fitted to their experience. They wanted to force everyone to go back into these jobs. And guess what? What happened? You know, those states that cut off benefits early, you know, those restaurants are still complaining that they can't find work. Only 8%. Uh, of the of the workers who were cut off benefits found a job uh, the next month uh, after you know they were cut off of benefits. We we cannot um, fill these jobs uh, in the way that they're currently currently put together. You know they're too often they're unsafe. Uh, the pay is not solid, and what the American worker is saying is that they're not going to go take this type of work anymore in these type of conditions. And, you know, this was, and the real problem here, this decision, you know, was made because of that political pressure and at a time when people had a hope that the situation would be better, different than now. Now, I would say at that point, we knew all these millions would, would be cut off because it just takes time to find work. Uh, and we know that there wasn't enough time between the spring and Labor Day for people to find work. But they had no mechanism in place because it's been a very willingly policy they had no mechanism in place to pivot, to tie it to the unemployment situation, to tie it to public health. Uh, and for that reason, um, you know, the benefits are ending. Uh, and it's really been a very negative uh, experience uh, in the sense that, you know, the there was some attempted reversals on the housing issue and other issues, student loans. But for this one, uh, we've gone again to the blame the victim, you know, idea. We're blaming the unemployed, uh, you know, for the situation when the money that was coming from unemployment, that's one reason the economy was recovering so well, because people had money in their pocket to spend. Uh, and that was benefiting exactly. everyone. Exactly. We, we, we had money in our pockets to spend. Now, again, 
whole bunch of black and brown people using that money to pay bills, to make sure that their, their basic needs were met. We weren't necessarily going to big box retailers and getting TVs like the caricature of, of poor black and brown people said, but we definitely were stimulating the economy when we had those benefits. Cutting them will not do the job. Andrew, Saru, you have made a persuasive argument to me. I hope the powers that be recognize the brilliance of your argument and the analytic precision that you're offering to say that we have to restore the benefits, but we also have to give people living wages, especially in industries where they historically have not. It's not enough to just restore the status quo. We must exceed the status quo in order to get economic justice for the vulnerable of America. Saru, Andrew, thank you both for joining me. Everybody, be sure to join the conversation. We want to hear from you. So make sure you go right over to the BNC Instagram and Twitter pages. Let us know how you feel. Also, visit our website, bnc.tv, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure you get all the clips from the show.